I'm just going to say hi and welcome to everyone. My name is Mark. I am, as the little tag says on my picture there with Square, a website development company here up in Dallas, Fort Worth. And I am a volunteer with TechSoup Connect, which you are all here to hear a presentation from tonight. And our guest tonight is a uh, round table and we're very excited to have them here. And I'm going to let them either introduce themselves or let Justin introduce our presenters tonight and let them take it away without any further time delay. Sure. I will pretend like I had something planned and introduce our two presenters tonight. So round table technology, we offer premier IT services for nonprofits. And so therefore we have a lot of experience with nonprofits and technology. Kim Snyder is our VP of data strategy and Joshua Pesquet is our three CPO, which I'll let him explain in a minute. They are going to give you a great presentation on data privacy and I'll let him take it from here. Thank you. I'm, I'm Kim Snyder, VP of data strategy, and I'll let Josh explain three CPO. <laughs> I'll only explain if anyone wants me to. <laughs> we'll just leave it. Oh, I want you to. <laughs> it's sort of, it's like a, it's a made up title because my previous title, no one understood anyway, which was BCIO slash cybersecurity. And I had to explain. So I function as a CI, virtual CIO for organizations that Roundtable works with, as well as for Roundtable itself. I function as what's called a CISO, which is a security officer, a cybersecurity officer for Roundtable, as well as for various clients that we work with and running the cybersecurity team at Roundtable and designing the security program for our clients. And then I also, along with Kim and Justin, design and plan all of the content and program delivery that we do. I can't take credit for it. A colleague about a year ago said, but you really should change your title three CPO because you're the three C-suite program officer. So I was like, I, that's great. <laughs> I actually changed my title to that. So it's the title. That's the story. And if you're a Star Wars nerd, yes, I understand that it's C-3PO is the character's name. It's deliberately reversed. Anyway. All right, so we thought we'd start with a little icebreaker where we would just see if anyone wanted to enter into the chat the most private sensitive information that you would never ever under any circumstances want to share publicly. If you would just go ahead, we could have everybody actually just put that into the chat for us and we'll be happy to proceed. But we have your private information. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to do that, what you could do is tell us sort of the one kind of question or one concern or one takeaway that you really, when you decided, hey, I'm gonna, you know, take a Tuesday evening and attend this webinar with these two folks from New York that I don't know what you would want to get out of it. We'd be interested to hear what questions. So wise or foolish to use a password manager? We will be happy to answer that, Eli. Van but wait, we've got some strong names. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Eli Vandergeesen. I hope I said that well. Short answer is nice. uh, we can get in when we get to the Q and A section. Eli will answer mm -hmm. that. Clients identifying financial info, uh, and we'll certainly touch on that. Doesn't no crash. And uh, do I require password protection for downloaded rosters with PII? Short answer to that. Sarah is a password protection, not necessarily, but encryption certainly would be a good idea. And we'll definitely touch on that tonight. So these are all great things. So let's keep those coming in, drop them in the chat and we'll try to get to, we've only got hopefully about 30 minutes of content. So we should have plenty of time for discussion and Q and A. We, we recognize this is a group that normally has a lot of conversations, so we don't want to bury you with, with content. All right. And with that, Kim, take it away here. Okay, so we're gonna. This is really meant to provide an overview of privacy and privacy today. And I also want to just add a note that we have resources. Josh and I love making resources that we make available to people. So if you, if, so I'm going to show you stuff. Whenever you see that little bird, that means this is a resource that's available, and you can get all of these things at RoundtableTechnology.com. Privacy stuff. Because I, it's more important that you listen than you worry about the details and you can hold on to these details. So let's talk about why privacy, why now? So you can, okay, there's two big reasons. The first 
we could say is privacy legislation, right? Which has been on the rise. This is a, this map on the left is from the International Association of Privacy Professionals. They keep this going. There's it's actually more gray here than while committees are in session, but there was a lot of blue earlier. So lots of laws are being passed in various states or at least are being introduced and being hashed back and forth in committee. So in any state that has read, it has a privacy law that has passed and any state in blue has a privacy law that's getting pretty close to passage that's in committee. States in gray had one that didn't quite make it into committee. Remember, we're just right out of the session now. The- Can I make a quick point about these yeah. privacy laws though, just so people aren't misled by whether your state has an active privacy law? It's really important to understand how privacy laws work, that it is not about the state in which the business operates. It's about the state in which the data subject, which we'll define more clearly, resides or is a citizen of. And so whether or not your organization operates in the states, any state that has a privacy law, if you have data on someone who is a resident of that state, then you are subject to that law. So yeah. can you proceed? Yes. And what we're seeing is what we'd say is a crazy quilt of different privacy legislation laws. And I'm going to talk about it in a moment, creating a standard or a standard to, to base a privacy response or privacy program around. But hold on to that thought. The other big reason is cyber crime. Okay. And this chart shows actually in dollars from 2001 from the, I think it's from the U.S. Department of Justice, cost of cyber crime. And basically, the, the important thing about this slide is the upward trajectory that continues by leaps and bounds, okay? Nonprofits are not at all the new, although sometimes they think so. They, nonprofits, it's fairly typical for people to say, what do they want from us? We don't have a lot of money. They want money, and what nonprofits have is data. And we have data about people, donors, things like that. As more data because as, as nonprofits, especially those working in, I'll say, potentially sensitive areas, we could say some media, journalism, women's health, those organizations are likely to be more highly targeted for cyber crime. They do want your money, but that's based on the value of your data. So these are two big reasons why privacy, why now? So if you want to, I just want to keep us on our clip so you can put yeah. to Well, by the way, Kim, this, uh, this doubled actually, the most recent number that I looked at in 2021, it was up over oh. in the United States. So we're actually on, a, yeah. on an almost exponential growth curve in terms of monetary damages from cyber. Yeah. COVID really rocked this because a lot of cyber criminals were stuck at home too. And so the U.S., so just a tiny bit of history. The U.S. privacy laws have been by and large sector focused, meaning HIPAA. So a lot of us have heard about health information being protected or FERPA. That refers to education records of students. So we had certain industry specific laws that we thought of as our privacy laws. And, the, and if we were an organization that received medical payments, then we were subject to HIPAA and we had to buckle ourselves in. And while that is true, the difference is a regulation like the, in the EU, the General Data Protection Regulation or GDPR, which actually came into effect in 2018, has a very different mindset about privacy. And it's a much more person as opposed to industry focused regulation. And, it, and GDPR asks us to think of privacy as an individual right. So protecting my privacy is my individual right. Now you could say these are also true of the U.S. laws. You could, we could view them that way. But I'd say, and I'm going to show you in the next slide, the different ways that GDPR, and you can move on. Um, so the individual privacy rights. So this is a slide, and this is a resource, a little bird. Okay, so these are the individual privacy rights defined by GDPR. And I'm gonna go clockwise around them, the right of information. So if you're gonna collect my data, the right of information means I have the right, A, to know that. I have the right to know why you're collecting the data. 
I have a right to know how you're going to use that data. So the data use statement, if you're collecting my data, how is that going to be used for marketing, for different kinds of records collection? And this does apply to the innocuous little email newsletter sign up. If I'm going to give you my data, you're going to tell, I have the opportunity to know why. I also have the right of access, which means I can ask you for my data. If you've collected my data, I can ask you for it. The right of rectification means if you have my data and there's something that I want changed or it's inaccurate or outdated, that I have the ability to ask you to please correct the data that you have and that you have the ability to follow through with that. The right of erasure, and that's the one that a lot of people are getting hit with in data subject deletion requests, which there's a whole market for generating those kinds of requests. And some nonprofits have probably received some of these to say, you collected my data. I want you to delete the data that you have about me. All of it. the right to restrict processing means if you're, I can ask you to stop using my data. Right? So you can collect my information, but I don't want you to use it for anything. I'm not going to ask for it back, but I, you, can, you have to be able to stop using it. Notification means if you're going to delete it or if you're going to correct it or restrict the processing, of it, you're going to tell me to let me know that, yes, you have done. So these are all some of my rights. Data portability, and this one is Facebook, I think this was a little bit more notorious. I've got to be able to ask you to give me my data back so I could take it somewhere else. And Facebook came up with a ridiculous way to do this, but to satisfy this law. The right to object and to avoid automated decision-making, probably less of a relevant issue for a lot of nonprofits. And this basically speaks to using my data to drive decisions like AI uses of my data, or if you're going to make a decision solely based on my data about whether or not I get a loan or get approved for a certain program or housing, solely based on my data. I have the right to object to that and to, to question that. So these are all my rights if you collect my data, right? So that's quite a game changer when we think about data collection. So if you go to the next slide. I just want to pause here just for a moment, just say that I think I don't know about everybody else and you can thumbs up or whatever if this resonates for you, but as individuals in the world, I think we all are very grateful for these rights and wish we had them protected in the U S the way that EU citizens have been protected, but as nonprofit professionals that are seeking to use data this becomes challenging for us because we've thought for a long time that the more data we have, the better we can serve our missions, the more information we have, and the more we can leverage that information. And so there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance, perhaps, and that as individuals, we really appreciate these protections, but they can be, can come across as onerous in terms of our current data practices. So I don't know if that resonates with folks, but that's certainly how I can feel at times. And uh, that Morse asked a question about privacy legislation around the world. GDPR has really shaped a lot of the legislation. And so it's a good foundation and it's also shaping all of the U.S. laws. In fact, on the IAP website, they, there's a, a legal tracker that shows all of these different rights and which of the different laws include these, right? And the, so GDPR, think of it as a model. And because there's so many different approaches to privacy, you're the safest following this as a standard, as Josh said in the comments. Okay. So I think what is protected. And so when we think about personal identifying information or PII, this is any information that can identify a person. And so that can be your name, address, phone number email, the list goes on your IP address or device identifiers or phones that are tracked and also providing geolocation information as we go around. Those things are all forms of identifiers. So the items in green are what we, and this is a resource that you can have. I want to stress that this is a sampler 
of many of the common types of personal identifying information. It's not by any means representative of all of it and different regulations will cite different types of data. But this gives you a good starting set to think about. Gender is also in there. So this information can be used either sometimes alone or in combination to identify an individual. In red, we have, oops, in red, we have sensitive information. Okay, so this is information that's high stakes information. This causes potential risk to people if this information gets compromised. And we're thinking here about social security, passwords, password hints, right? Because people can be subject to financial risk if some of this information gets out there. Passport information, health records. And we're hearing about this a lot more recently. Privacy around health and also the vulnerability that people have if health records get compromised. Financial records, who's giving money to what organizations, right? That's a nonprofit. One form of financial record that's important for nonprofits. We also have credit card information, that type of thing, where your identity theft or is a risk. The orange ones, the, or, the items in orange are what we call the GDPR special categories. So GDPR includes these as special types of information that's protected. And this may come as a surprise to some of us in the U.S., right? Race and ethnicity, religious and philosophical belief, political opinions. We can see how if this information gets compromised in certain settings, it could pose a hazard to the individual. And remember, GDPR is about protecting the rights and safety of an individual, right? Trade union membership is considered special category and under GDPR. Biometric genetic information, health again, and sexuality. So this is a good kind of guide to thinking about types of protected information and but is by no means a comprehensive list. So the basic premise is this, and Josh was just speaking to it. We heard for a long time, data is the new oil. Data, the, the more data we have, the more value we have. We need to have data in order to have a lot of value. But if you click again, this premise in the age of privacy and cybercrime is very challenged. If you think about data as belonging to the individual, organizations using an individual's data are really borrowing for licensing. It's not my organization's data. It's data that's still, it's information that belongs to the person. And that's the paradigm shift that a more privacy focused environment has or asks us. Josh, anything you want to add? Yeah. The phrase that I use quite regularly is that I think a lot of organizations, both in the for-profit and nonprofit sectors think of, have thought of data as an asset, as something that has value and only an asset. So the more that I have, the more value that I can potentially get out of those assets. And what I encourage people to think about is that in the realm of privacy laws and cybercrime running rampant, data is also a liability, right? So if you have an asset at home, you have some gold bars, let's say, they have value to you, but if they're stolen, you simply lost that value. But imagine if not only losing those gold bars lost the value that they had to you, but you then had to pay some penalty <laughs> for the number of gold bars that you lost. It was $10,000 per gold bar that you lost track of because that was part of the law. So these things are abilities as well, and it's important to understand that. Data is an asset and a liability. Uh, so what does this mean for us as organizations? If you go to the next slide. Okay, so here's the deal. The right to be forgotten by ads from data to be deleted means everywhere. And I've been working Actually, Josh and I have been working together for a long time, nonprofits, 28 years. That, that's, that is true. Um, and we've seen a lot of nonprofit organizations and their data situations. And I think 
silo is a word that a lot of organizations would use to describe themselves. And I think judgment-free zone, you've got a lot of important mission-based work to do. So keeping track of all these different data silos can be tricky and hard. But the right to be forgotten means not just delete it from the one place I know it exists. Oh, and it's in our CRM. Okay, this person's record is here. Oh, but wait, that's right. We use constant contact or HubSpot. And that connects to our CRM. Okay, I guess their data is also there. And, and oh yeah, Razor's Edge. And then what well, was in the report and we downloaded it and gave it to our mailing house, et cetera. So exports, reports, backups, these are all forms of data that if I say, I want you to delete my records or if someone comes to me and says, delete me, I need to be able to delete that person and know that I did. And so when I notify them and tell them I did, I know that their data isn't anywhere. So what does that mean? By the way, I, oh, sorry. Yes, go ahead. I was going to say, if any of you read about or regrettably were uh, victims of the BlackBot data breach that people got notifications about, I believe it was March 2020, there were organizations that had not been BlackBot customers for multiple years who wound up being a part of that breach because their data was were was in backups that BlackBot was retaining that were breached by the attackers. And we'll cover this later when we talk about reasonable safeguards. But <laughs> think of how you would feel if you had your data breached and had to send out notifications to thousands of your constituents because a vendor that you hadn't worked with in several years still had your data and lost track of it because they failed to delete it. So that's an example of a very large company failing to do this effectively. Go ahead, Kim. And they're big boo there, just so you know, all 50 states have reach notification rules. And that's been for a while. That's not, not a new thing. They waited an inordinate amount of time before informing people. The more time ticks by the data's out there, the more people are at risk. So I, I feel like we're giving like the bad news. A, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it around. Sorry. It's just another resource. All right. So I think about information privacy and Roundtable. We have a very developmental approach to technology maturity, technology development. We know that organizations are juggling a thousand things and that it's an incremental, highly iterative path forward, right? Where a lot of organizations start somewhere that's what we'd say is reactive, right? So there's a lot of privacy risks, assessments aren't taking place, or privacy is not even on people's brain until someone gets a data subject access request and then, oh, wow, what do we do? They're asking us to delete their data. Do I even need to have to do this? And so that can sometimes kick it into gear. So hopefully that and webinars such as this help organizations say, okay, take a little bit more of a proactive approach to A, this universe rife with cyber crime and sensitive information in digital form. And we're going to all right, we're going to take some ownership of that. Okay, we have limited resources, so we'll put our accidental data nerd, and that's, uh, I think, a universal term, right, for it's someone who owns the data or who minds the shop. And that person has an eye on the data in the organization. And so we start with data inventories, data mapping, you start to know where our data all is. And we start to give staff and employees and volunteers some security and privacy training so that they know what they're up against. And we understand what our risks are. So that's adapting. And I'd say for nonprofits on these developmental roadmaps, it's not, yes, to be at level four leading is an excellent place to be. A lot of nonprofits do quite well in the adapting, integrating levels two and three in these areas where it starts to become more formalized and someone leads privacy at the organization and then information management becomes more of a practice, a day-to-day -day practice. But this is a very incremental path and I want to stress that, but I want to have this available because it, for everyone here, 
because it does give you some characteristics and some things to look out for as you think about your own organization and where you are now and where you want to be. Uh, Anything else, Josh? Yes, let's, uh, let's jump into our activity. And we've been we've been doing a lot of lectures. Oh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, so I've got the URL. I'll drop mm -hmm. that in, and then we'll go there ourselves. And so, you want me to talk everybody through it, Kim, or you want to do it? Sure. You have been talking a lot. Okay. So here's how this works. So hopefully, people are able to get to this link. And we have these are not all the data privacy practices that you might think about, but they're four of what we would consider to be the kind of bigger ones. So thinking about collection and classification, which is, do we actually know as an organization, all the data that we do collect and do we classify it in any way and say, this information is constitutes PII or sensitive information or GDPR, do we classify information in any way? So that's one practice storage, do we actually know all the places the data goes? So when someone registers for a webinar, do they go into our CRM system? Do they go anywhere else? What, where does that data wind up? Does it then wind up on a backup? And does that backup ever get deleted if we like that? Security, are we thinking about how we're protecting that information, both while it's at rest and in transit and all the systems that it winds up in? And then disposal, do we have any kind of a policy for when we get rid of data and how do we dispose of that data and make sure that it's not there. So what we'd like everybody to do, and this is anonymous, is just grab a dot and for each of these practices, indicate where your organization is at. So if I were doing round table and I said, we're not doing collection and class, like I have no idea what data we have and we don't oh. classify it at all, I'd put a red dot over there. If I thought we were doing it, really well and really formally, I'd put a green dot there. And so everybody go ahead and grab whatever dot you think is appropriate for the level of practice that you have in your area. And while we're doing this, I'll say if there is anyone who wants to talk about your practice, whether it is a, we're absolutely doing this formally and we're pretty confident we're doing a good job. You're the kind of, maybe you could tell us what kind of means to you. And if you're not doing it, tell us why, what are the obstacles to not doing it? Or is it just, you've not thought about doing it yet. So I'll take any volunteer, if anyone wants to talk about their particular practice at your organization. There's a lot of sort of. Yep. That's... And disposal is hard, right? Whoever put the green dot on security, if you're willing to tell us about the formal practice that you have around protecting your data, because that's what we're going to go and do next, I'd be very interested to hear from you, particularly if you're willing to speak up. That might be me, uh, Josh. Uh, this is Neil. I guess all I would have to say is that we have consultants who monitor really with respect to any access of the data. And that we clearly use encryption and other security protocols with respect to access and management of the data. Okay. Thank you, Dylan. Does anyone else have anything they want to say on this? I'm also curious if people are, if they're, if this is about what you would have expected in terms of responses from other organizations, or if people find this surprising, sort of where we're landing at as a group, which is speaking frankly, a, a pretty stark lack of formal practices in any of these really, except for just a couple of organizations. So could you do it well? I could, oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. This is Michelle. Hi. So we have, we're a very tiny organization, but we've been collecting data for a long time because we're an older organization, but that data is held on our machines and on our backups and we just started cloud backups last year yeah. so the thing that i'm unsure of is in terms of storage i know the three devices that we have data stored on but when we talk about it going to the cloud not a hundred percent sure it goes to the cloud so what does that mean and then that has an impact on security because we have a website provider who gives us security, but only on 
from the website perspective, and this data is in, it's in a straight database. It's a FileMaker database. I'm not a hundred percent sure where things yep. go, but we never get rid of anything. So I'm pretty good on disposal. Uh, yeah, the, the cloud data backups, it so much depends on what provider you're using for that. And what are the practices that you're using to back that data up and how you're protecting it? And we can, I want to, Kim, we are actually getting a little tight on time. So I want to make sure we do have time for Q and A. So why don't we cruise through the, your last couple of the security yep. section. And then Michelle, we'll circle back to that when we get to Q and A, yep. because we can dive in that a little deeper, but all right. But thank you everybody. That was excellent. All right. So let's get back to our webinar. So yeah, Kim, can we try to hustle through and hustle spot. back. Why don't you take this to life cycle? Okay. Yeah. So really what this is asking us to do is to think of data as having a life cycle in our organization and managing it throughout. And Sarah, I believe, asked a question and just uh, practices and compliance, right? And I will answer it. And this is the topic of another webinar, which I'm sure we'll be at some point doing. And that's on your data handling policy, data classification and handling, because that is how you define how people in the organization use information. In the absence of policy, this can much more easily run amok. But what data life cycle management is asking us to do is to ask these questions, and you will get a copy of the slides, right, about data at all points, from the point that we get it into our organization to how we store it, how we securely store it, who can access it while it's stored? Do we control who can get to it? Do we share it with people? If we Do we get people's consent first? And then finally, do we keep it forever? Or do we have a certain deletion cutoff point? Those are all policies. There's no absolutely perfect right or wrong policy. It is something that as an organization, you would want to develop in a way that makes sense for the culture of your organization. But that it is a meaty topic right here, but this is how you address a lot of this practice in your organizations. So Josh, on to security. On to security, sure. And the reason that we have to talk about security in the data privacy webinar is in, in effect, you can't have data. If you are in fact collecting data that needs to be protected in any way, you can't really have privacy without cybersecurity, because if you can't protect the information, then the privacy is going to be a real problem for all the information that you have, the reasons that hopefully are obvious. So let's talk about the things that you need to do. Now, now cybersecurity is a huge topic unto itself. So in regards to the webinar today, I'm going to try to keep this both high level and give you some really practical kind of simple framework to think about security, all right? The first of which is that the information management and data leadership is increasingly a separate role within organizations. So smaller nonprofits, many of you here probably think of everything technology under one rule, under one function. So you just have your IT person and she's just responsible for everything. So whether you need a new computer, need a new database, need to comply with GDPR, it's all that person. But as these functions get more and more complex and as organizations get larger, these roles are breaking out or you have the kind of data side of the house, people that are responsible for managing the data in the organization, the governance of that data, figuring out what privacy regulations apply. And then the other side, you've got this kind of cybersecurity piece, which is people that are responsible for setting the policies around what personnel can and can't do on their computers, what kind of password systems you use, what kind of authentication systems you use, access controls, all of the kind of technical stuff around cybersecurity, as well as thinking about the overall posture. Okay. So whether these are all in one person, right, or in one function to your organization, whether they're broken up, it's important to understand that they are different functions. So there's this idea of understanding what's all the data we have. At, what kind of protection does it need? And then the other side is responsible for implementing that protection around that data. Hopefully that made sense. In New York, where Kim and I operate, they, we came up with the New York Shield Act, which went into effect of March of 2020. 
Uh, you can imagine uh, how much nonprofits in New York were paying attention to that privacy regulation in March of 2020. They were maybe distracted by some other mild thing that was going on at that time. Uh, but it is uh, hitting them a lot through audits right now. And it's the kind of thing, um, Eric dropped a question uh, in the chat that to Kim's point earlier, when we finished all the privacy regulations, I would expect that states like Texas are going to be seeing regulations like these sooner or later, whether they're implemented at the federal level or whether they're simply going to wind up applying to Texas organizations because they're going to ultimately have data from subjects that reside in states that have their own privacy laws and therefore their citizens are protected by them. Or even right now, if you have data on a New York person, you are subject to New York Shield, right? If you have data on an EU citizen, you are subject to GDPR. And the New York Shield Act put together this reasonableness standard for security safeguards. And the reasonableness standard has a long history in court. If any of you are lawyers or legal folks, you'll be familiar with that. And I think this is the best way to start thinking about security for your organization and for the data of people for whom you are collecting their data, whether they're constituents or donors or volunteers or staff, whoever it is. So let's say that me and Maria von Haften have some kind of a data exchange. I've collected some data from Marie that contains her email address and her home address and her date of birth and some other information. And let's say I collected that information a year ago. And it turns out that I had a data breach and I have to notify Marie and say, hey, Marie, look, I'm really sorry. I lost your data. Marie then is going to potentially ask me some questions and say, what data did you have on me? And I'll say, Marie, I had your name and your email address and your data birth. So why did you have those? And I'll say, you signed up for our newsletter. I'll say, okay, I get why you had my name and my email address. Why did you need my date of birth? for your newsletter. I'm like, well, I don't know. We just collected it. All of a sudden it's not real reasonable. <laughs> Marie is just asking some very simple questions that I'm having a hard time answering them in a way that sounds reasonable. Marie then further says, what were you doing to protect my data? Did you, had you had a risk assessment done? Were you using any kind of password policies? And they say, oh, really? We meant to do like a risk assessment, but we never really got to that. And uh, yeah, all our staff used the same passwords for everything. Maria is going to say, let's, you, you weren't reasonably protecting my data. That conversation goes really badly. On the other hand, okay, if it goes like this, I collected it six months ago. I just had Marie's name and email address. Marie asked me, why do you have it? I said, you signed up for a newsletter. She said, oh, that's right. I did. Okay. That makes sense. You would have that information. What were you doing to protect it? We did a risk assessment. We had a whole roadmap of things that we were doing. We'd done everything according to the roadmap. What we were going to do was next month, we were going to secure our backups, but we hadn't gotten to that yet. And there was a breach with our backup provider and your data was part of that breach. And so really sorry that happened. We were working on it. We just hadn't gotten to that. Then Marie could say, okay, that sounds all reasonable. So that's what I encourage you to go through as a practice. Put yourself in the position of a data subject who you have lost their data and have to tell them, hey, we lost this on you. And think about the kinds of questions they might ask you and whether your answers to those questions would sound reasonable. It's, I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but that actually works pretty well as a starting place for your security. Does anyone have questions on that? That makes sense to everybody. Marie, are you okay with all that? I hope I didn't traumatize you. Lose just, just the date of birth. I mean, it sounds vague, and there's a certain level of vague to these regulations. Question, do you keep how you get their information? Ideally, in a data inventory, yes. The source of the data, where did it come from? Did it come from the person themselves? Or did you collect it somewhere else? That's become more of an issue, by the way, with people getting more data from like social media. And you know, you may not, Marie may not even know, have ever had contact with Josh's organization. All right. Yeah. So Sarah, to, to your question, so Sarah's asking about around security and whether you're compliant, all those things. And do you keep how you get, get people's data? 
in regard to these privacy regulations, something like GDPR, you have to be very transparent about how you look at their data. In fact, you can't get it without consent. Here in the U.S., there's quite a few less protections. So our data, I'm sure for anyone who follows this, your data is sold all the time and aggregated by all kinds of parties. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So there's not as many protections in the U.S. Our hope is that those protections are going to be coming and they're coming in some states. We'll see if they make it to a federal level or if they reach a sort of critical mass across all the different states. Okay. So Kim, I don't know, do you... Did you have anything particularly you want to say on the ethics side before we get into our last couple of slides? I mean, I guess in some ways the it's it's the brighter side of this. Yes, it's for on behalf of regulations. Yes, it's in response to growing cyber crime and threats from all over the place. But at the same time, what these practices ask us to do is really this more responsible ownership of data. And that's where it crosses into data ethical data practices. And I think, so these are, well, there's a kind of a grunt work element to this kind of stuff. There's a, there's a burdensome feel. It also is ethical practices of data. And the more our society and culture is saturated in digital information, the more we're going to have to make these decisions. And we're going to get dark. Well, a little bit dark for a minute, and I just want to prepare folks for that, which is to on this idea of the ethics of it, I've been working for over a decade now in cybersecurity with at-risk organizations and individuals. My colleague Destiny has joined us here. She and I both do a lot of work with journalists, social justice organizations, human rights activists, climate change activists, that depending on the country in which they live, data being exposed about them and the work that they're doing and the people that they're working with can have real life repercussions that in some cases can be quite serious, can lead to being apprehended and jailed all the way up to being physically harmed. And so the stakes for protecting information on certain stakeholders can get very high. Now let's put ourselves if we want, in the shoes of a internet service provider in the state of Texas. So internet service providers are allowed to collect the browsing data of people whom they serve. And so they're collecting that data all the time so they can sell it to advertisers. Now, on an ethical level, okay, if I'm an internet service provider in the state of Texas and I'm in a person who I am providing services to is browsing information on how to get abortions, where to get abortions in the state of Texas. That is information that can be legally subpoenaed by the state of Texas in order to press charges against that person or the providers or people with whom they're in contact with. So the internet service providers have to ask themselves do we want to have this data, right? Because if we have it, then it potentially can actually cause harm to our customers. And if you put yourself in the position of a nonprofit, wherever you're operating and think of the data that you have on different kinds of stakeholders, right? Based on the different sensitivities they may have. There are certain places in the U.S. where, you know, obviously, Seeking information on abortions is now something that is legally problematic. And so if you have information on that, that is highly sensitive. And if you fail to protect that information, or if you collect that information, when in fact you have no reasonable need to, you are creating quite significant risk for stakeholders in a way that you could argue is unethical, right? And so that's where this starts to get very challenging for organizations when you think about the different kinds of information you're collecting on different stakeholders with whom you work. All right. So that's an increasingly important thing to think about in this world, especially when, you know, the information that you collect, that Google collects, that Facebook collects, that TikTok collects is one legal subpoena away from being in the hands of the FBI or the nation state of 
to India or any entity that may seek to get information about those stakeholders. So Michelle has a question. Let's say you don't collect that data. How then do you continually follow up with potential customers? So Michelle, I think that's a question in terms of, so the reason that the internet service providers going with a specific example want to have this information is so they can sell it to advertisers. So if I search for how do I increase my muscle mass, they can send me ads for EMC and kettlebell stores and different, whatever it is. That's why they want to collect that information. It, they're viewing it as an asset. It has value. However, right. In the climate that we're in, it can also be a pretty significant liability, not just for the ISP, but obviously for their customers who could be significantly compromised by that same information. So that's when the kinds of things that you're searching for and browsing for can cause you potential harms, that becomes a much more loaded situation. Does that answer your question, Michelle? Not entirely, because yes. the problem is that although my organization doesn't operate quite this way. I know a lot of organizations that say, if you come to us seeking information, you are a potential customer. And if I shouldn't keep any of your data, how is it that I get potential customers? Or you make one inquiry, how do I follow up with you if I don't have that data on hand? I but I think it's not so much that you can't collect the data. So responsible data practices, thank you. <laughs> responsible data practices means you're going to collect that which you need, right? So on these customers, you probably don't need their social security, blah, blah, blah. So you, it's data minimization. You collect the minimal amount of data that you need in order to do the for your business practices, and then you protect it. And this is where the cybersecurity practices come in, awareness training. We had some questions in the earlier part of this dropped in. Is our password managers wise? Absolutely. These types of things that you can put into place as your day-to-day -day practice in building a culture in your organization of security and privacy, that is how, but you have to do that. Thank you. That helps a whole lot. Because, yeah, none of us are, I don't think, are ISPs. We're not Google. And they have different reasons. But you do have legitimate business purpose for collecting stuff. So they don't need to collect. I'm going to turn up the slide deck and we'll open it up for questions. So Suzanne has got a question. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Thank you for taking my question. So this probably overlaps between uh, information management and uh, data management, I think. This would be a hypothetical, let's say I'm asking for a friend and uh, a hypothetical nonprofit that has one, one employee uh, and there, this nonprofit has a Google Workspace and other a CRM and things like that. But the board wants to have more than just that one employee. And there's only one employee. They want to have more than just the one employee have access to the Google Workspace, be an ad. They want to have somebody else be an admin also for some of these spaces, uh, just in case the one employee leaves suddenly. Who, it, besides a board member, who might be able to hold that in a safe and uh, in a safe way? Or is there a way for a second person to possibly hold it without giving them access to the information? Do you follow my question? Yeah, absolutely. This is Susanna. That's a super common kind of question and problem in organizations, large and small, right? Which is how do we give someone administrative access to systems without giving them access to sensitive information? And the short answer is it's not difficult, right? You can, you can restrict permissions to certain data within Google Workspace, even so that an admin can't do it. So Destiny and I and Kim can all be admins in the Google Workspace, but Destiny can still make a folder that only she and Kim have access to that I can't get access to, all right? And being an admin is not going to allow me to get access to it. Now, what I would be able to do as an admin 
is go and reset Kim's password or reset Destiny's password and log in under their account and go access it. But they would know that happened because there, I wouldn't be able to put the password back to something because I won't know what it was. So there's that protection in place. Does that make sense, Susanna? So you can have those kinds of controls in place. Then there's what's called logging. And this would, you might need some help. You could go to Google support for that. And just make sure that logging is enabled for any changes to accounts, for any changes to folders, permission changes. And then you would have an audit log if that this board member or this other person went and did the monkey business with the permissions on those systems. Does that help? Yeah, I, I think that basically this organization wants two super admins in the case of the Google workspace, but uh, wants to have a way that the second super admin can't can't access certain things so we might have to have some compromising discussions there and make them a comp an admin with only certain permissions instead of a super admin okay yeah. thank you thank you that's certainly the sort of thing that we can help you with a short consult susanna so you can feel free to reach out to eric or justin out there in texas and be happy to get someone to help you with that other questions uh, i think we're getting close to time mark i'm happy to answer other questions if folks have them. I'm sure Kim, you're playing with it as well, but I also want to be sensitive to wrapping it up if we need to wrap it up. Yes, there are ways. Sarah has a question about encryption in Office 365. And yes, you would need to collect, you would need to protect it because especially if it's people who are, who are EU citizens or even not, you do want to protect it and you can protect and control access. Office 365. John yes. can speak more to that, but you can get pretty kind. My question is I've been told that we needed additional protections, not just if it's sitting in Office 365 that only certain people have access. We were told that we needed additional protections like passwords for any files that have PII beyond they. Only people who have like access to that SharePoint site with their company password have access to it. We each document would need an individual password. Yeah. So the, the each document needing an individual password, I hate to throw under the bus, whoever gave you that advice, but that's, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with that being an approach that anyone would recommend to protecting data. Thank you. PII being in like a SharePoint is generally speaking fine. The vulnerabilities would be primarily around the security of the accounts that have access to it. So if you aren't using like multi-factor authentication and everybody's password on your Office 365 tenant is password, then that data is not very secure, but it is in fact encrypted while it's sitting in OneDrive or in SharePoint. And if you wanted to put additional protections on it, Sarah, in order to improve it, you would want to use the Microsoft 365 security and compliance tools that gets complex, but there's a function that's referred to as data loss prevention or DLP, where you could prevent people from say, downloading a spreadsheet that has a bunch of PII in it. So you could set rules that say, Hey, if a document has like email addresses in it or social security numbers in it. And someone goes into our SharePoint and tries to download that to their workstation locally, our kind of DLP, our data loss prevention will say, you can't do that. That's not allowed because this has sensitive information. So we're not going to allow a copy that is unprotected to be created on your workstation. Without those protections, you have some risk that people may download that PII and email it around and do all sorts of other things that remove it from those Microsoft protections. But as you've described it, Sarah, I think it's perfectly fine and password protecting it document by document sounds very onerous and not particularly helpful to me. Yes. And our colleague Destiny has a lot to say, <laughs> asset controls and audits and some of the things the data loss prevent of protection that you were just talking about. But yes, you can protect it. And if it's local, it says destiny, encrypted hard drive. We have reached the hour mark. I want to 
thank Kim and Josh for joining us this evening with a great presentation and thank everyone who joined us this evening. You guys want to real quick, give a shout out to your organization, where to find more information. Justin, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I think that, yes, as I explained before, if anyone's interested in talk to us more about cybersecurity, data, IT, anything like that, you can visit us at roundtabletechnology.com.